I want to turn with us over to the book of Exodus. I'm so thankful that uh, uh, the Lord was with President Trump yesterday. Amen. Amen. I was thinking as I was getting dressed this morning how saddened my heart would be for this nation had that young man, a young person that was so blinded and deceived by Satan to do an act like that, I would be so saddened if he had succeeded in that today and would say, well, my goodness, what are we going to do now? I know the Lord is our hope. It's not in one man, but I thank God for men who will stand. Amen. Amen. I thank God for the man that gave the invitation. Actually, it was a woman gave the invitation for me to get saved. Amen. Yes. Mankind. Men and women alike. I thank God for people like that. And I was telling someone here uh, earlier that just moments after that young man pulled them triggers and that bullet came in and got him, instantly he lifted his eyes in hell. You say, Brother Whitfield, you judging him? I'm looking at his fruit. I don't think he had time to repent. And Satan had him so blinded. And that's not only ones. Between yes, last yesterday evening and right now, there's been multi- hundreds and thousands who Satan has blinded and has left this world and went into hell. Blinded. Think they're doing good and all the time they're doing wrong. See, when you're like this, you don't see anything wrong with anything. It's when the Lord comes and shines his light that we see. Amen. Exodus in the 27th chapter in verse number 20. And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring thee, everybody say it, pure oil. Pure oil. Olive beaten for the light. Reminds you of Christ, don't it? He was beaten to bring light to us. To cause the lamp to burn Always, let us pray. Father, we want to thank you most of all for who you are, for the greatness of your presence today. Speak to our hearts, Lord. In this, in this room, Lord, there, you know even the hairs on every one of our head is numbered. That's how special we are to you. You have placed a number on every one of them. You know us, Lord, better than we know ourselves. And Father, I'm like, David said, Lord, search my heart. Lord, search our hearts today and reveal anything in our lives that should not be there, Lord. Father, so that we be prepared to leave this world because we're all going to leave here one day. And Father, we just give you the glory for this word today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The Lord said to Moses, Thou shalt command the children, command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure oil, olive beaten for light, to cause the lamp to burn always. That word pure means clear, means no contaminants of this world. Pure means clean which is holy and innocent. Find in Ezekiel in the 22nd chapter, there was no rain upon the land because the priest was putting no difference between clean and unclean and holy and profane. It was just kind of all blended together. And therefore there was no rain upon the land. God can't bless a mess, can he? Oil means anointing, and it's the anointing of God. Oil kind of keeps things running smooth, amen? Take your oil out of your car and see how far you go. Oil represents the Holy Ghost or the anointing of God in our lives. Makes things better. In fact, the church and individuals with no anointing is like a candlestick with no oil. And Peter 
And Jude talks about it and says there are wells without water. What is a well without water? Just an empty hole. The clouds with no rain. I don't want to be that way, do you? He said in Isaiah in the, in the 10th chapter in verse 27, I want to read it up here on the screen with you. He said, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away. Who is his? Satan's burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder. And he is Satan's yoke that he yokes people up like he was yoked with that young man on that rooftop shooting. He was yoked with him to let him to do that. It'll take it off his shoulder. And the yoke shall be, say that word, destroyed. But that means that by twisting. It's destroyed by twisting. You can't put it back together. How is it destroyed? Because of the anointing. The anointing. We need the anointing. Amen. Amen. It's in Hebrews in the first chapter, verse number nine, it says, Thou hast loved righteousness. I know he's talking about Jesus Christ here, but he says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness. They sing about that. Uh, above thy fellows. He's talking to Jesus Christ, but he's also talking to me and you. When we love righteousness, uh, and we hate iniquity, then God puts his favor or his anointing upon us. Amen. Are you with us this morning? We're going somewhere with this. God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all, the word of God tells us. God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. Darkness is the absence of light. That's what darkness is. So if we have God, which is light, there's no way darkness can come into our lives. The problem is, the further we get away from the light, the more we begin to walk in darkness. And we drift away from the things of God or the ways of God or the standards of God, uh, and we lose our way. We walk in and groping in darkness. We understand and we see so many. But as long as we have God, then we're in light and darkness uh, cannot overtake us, cannot be part of our lives. That's why he said in Matthew in the 16th chapter in verse 18 to Peter, he said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. We understand because we're in the light. As long as we're in the light, the gates of hell or anything that comes through the gates of hell cannot prevail against a church that's anointed. Are you with me this morning? He said, command them that they put pure oil in it to, to cause the lamp to burn always. Amen. You know, uh, some people, when you talk about hell, they'll say, well, I, I don't believe in hell. That doesn't change the degree one bit. I don't believe in hell. And it's kind of like in you need to go to that man in Luke, the 16th chapter that Jesus talked about the story there of the rich man. He died and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments. And he said in Luke, in the 16th chapter, verse 24, the very last part of it when he's telling Abraham to send Lazarus to dip his tip of his finger in water. And that young man that pulled that trigger is saying the same thing this morning. He says, for I am tormented in this flame. Well, Brother Whitfield, I don't believe in hell. It don't change it one bit, does it? But one thing about it, somewhere down there is something hot. Jesus, you remember when he was on the cross in John 19, 30, and he said, it is finished. Uh, he came down off that cross. He went down to the heart of the earth because he said in Matthew 12, 40, he said, as Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. He went down there. He took the keys away from Satan. He delivered the Old Testament saints out, amen, and paradise down there in the heart of the earth is empty now where Abraham was at, uh, but that rich man is still burning and being tormented in those flames for over 2,000 years and still there. They say that Russia took and drilled down for miles into the ground. Now, if you look it up online, they say that Snoops, how you say that? S-N-O-P-E-S, 
Snopes, whatever it is that checks out stories, they say that wasn't really true, but I've caught them messing stuff up. They're not right either. And so they drilled down and they ran a microphone down that was heat sensitive and they ran that microphone down until it finally burned up, but right before it burned up, they heard screams down in the heart of the earth. He said, brother, I don't, I don't believe that trash. I don't believe that. Well, let me tell you, something hot down there. Y'all ever seen a volcano? That's molten rock coming up out of the ground. You see, hell wasn't de de designed for mankind. It was designed for Satan and his angels, the fallen angels. We understand. But because man has decided to go the way of Satan, uh, he said in Isaiah in the fifth chapter, in verse number 13, he said, Therefore my people are going into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitude is dried up with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. Hell, whenever you take and put, keep putting something in a glass of water, after a while, what does it do? It runs over. That's where volcanoes come from, my friends. It's something hot down there. Well, Brother Whitfield, I still don't believe in hell. <laughs> well, you'll just have to take it up with God. But one day, you will if you don't accept Jesus Christ. You'll find out. He said in Psalms 9 and 17, he said, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all nations, uh, and all people, and all churches uh, that forget God. Amen? That's what he says. That's the word of God telling us that. We're living in a time where there is no absolutes. That's where this message came from. Absolutes. We're living in a time where there is no absolutes. You know? I mean, whenever you remove the standard of God and the ways of God, anything goes. Because God said in the very beginning, made them male and female. Amen? Now they got all kind, non-binary, binary, whatever, you know, I could be a man today and a woman tomorrow. And I mean, it's no, it's no absolutes. It's just whatever will be. You can be an animal, a cat, whatever. You be the, they, them. You know where they get that from? I identify my pronoun as the, they and them and we. That's my pronouns. That's what they'll say. I don't understand it all, but it kind of reminds me there in the Mark in the fifth chapter when they, when Jesus talking to that young man that was full of demons and he says, what's your name? He says, my name is Legion for we. <laughs> we are many. I identify as we. They, them. Who's behind all that? I know who exactly who's behind all that. Anytime you go against God, I know exactly who's behind it. Amen? Are you with me? It's kind of sad, isn't it? Absolute means not diminish in any way. Remember he said over there to Moses, do not diminish my word one bit. Revelation, don't add to, take away. Keep my word pure. We understand. It also means existing independently and not in relation to other things. God is unique and complete in himself. You got to understand, God don't need us. We need God. Man thinks that God needs us. No, 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 no. We need God. How many knows we need God? Amen? I done proved without God, I mess up. You see, God is, is complete in himself. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He said, Malachi, he said, I change not. He said, my people change. People change, but God is the same. He's unchanging. He's the same. He said in Proverbs in the 22nd chapter, verse 28, this is all still laying a foundation of where we're going this morning. It's a long foundation, huh? A good foundation to keep the building up. You ever see them start building something and they go for months out there and all you see is dirt. So what are they going to start building? They're getting ready. But if that foundation ain't right, my friend, ain't nothing else right. Are you with me? Proverbs 22 and 28, he says, Remove not 
the ancient landmarks. Remove not the ways of God. Remove not the standards of God. The landmarks are boundaries or borders. It is the territory that's enclosed. He says, remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have set. I trust the preachers of yesterday more than I trust the preachers of today. Amen? My dad used to say, them young preachers might beat me to church, but they won't know what to do when they get there. <laughs> Amen? I wish I was half the preacher my dad was. Amen? No, I'm telling you, I, I've, these eyes have seen something. My dad wasn't a very educated man. My mom couldn't read or write. But let me tell you, they do the power of God. These eyes have seen miracles of God. These eyes, my friend, I could sit all day long and tell you some things. I've, these eyes have seen the mighty move of God, that God is real. And I believe President Trump this morning when he said, in giving God the glory, I believe that kind of let him know there's a little bit more higher power than him this morning. Yeah. Hallelujah, God is real. <laughs> Woo, I believe God said all this. I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. Hallelujah. Do you feel God directing your lives? God's real and good and mighty. Landmarks also means to twist as a rope. Ecclesiastes 4 and 12, it says a threefold cord not quickly broken. Amen? We understand when we twist our lives up in God, it makes us stronger. You take one little cord and it's easy to pop. But if you take them three cords like that and put them together and twist them, my friend, and pull, amen. That thing's strong, isn't it, Ryan? That old rope is pretty strong, isn't it? Pull them old trees around, won't it? But you take one strand of that and it's nothing to it, is it? That's just like one life without God. It's nothing to it. But when we begin to twist our life up in God, amen, get all tangled and twisted in God, amen, hallelujah, we can make it. Are you with me? That's why he tells us in, in Isaiah, in the 40th chapter, verse 31, he says, but they that wait, that word wait means twist. Uh, those that will twist upon the Lord uh, shall renew their strength and shall mount up with wings as eagle and they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint. No wonder people are, are quitting on God and the least little thing in the world distracts them because they're not twisted in God. They can't hold on, hallelujah. Heard Brother R.W. Schaumbach say, when you find yourself at the end of the rope, he said, tie a knot in it and hold on. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> Help us, Lord. The landmarks, they start by moving them. How many own some property? You know you got landmarks on the corners of your property? You know that? Well, if your neighbor started moving them, Y'all get upset, wouldn't you? But yet we sit back and let the religious world move the landmarks that our forefathers have set up and we don't say nothing about it. We allow it, the enemy come in and move them on our own selves. Amen? Starts moving them. That's, that's the way it always starts. Just a little leaven, just a little bit. I said, well, that's not much. He, he didn't move it far. I ain't going to say nothing. And they keep moving it. After a while, they just remove it. Take it away. And then you're in a place of no absolutes. One state just passed. Y'all help me in which state it was to put the Ten Commandments back into the schools. I mean, what's wrong is thou shalt not murder. What's wrong with it? Thou shalt not steal. I mean, I mean, that's just decency. I shall not lie. I mean, what's wrong with that? How many believe it's all right to tell a lie? I'd like to got you, didn't I? <laughs> How many Christians I have in here this morning? It's backslid. Your heads go up. 
God's good, isn't he? They start removing the landmarks. Over in 1 Samuel in the 22nd chapter, we see the story here of a priest named Eli. And he said that he was very, was, was very old and got old, complacent. Don't want to say nothing anymore. All the sons heard all that the sons did. He heard it all what was going on in Israel. How that they how that they lay with the women that assembled the door of the tabernacle in the church. Laying with women in the church. Didn't say nothing about it. Let it go on. What do you say to the church? One of the churches are in Revelation. I have somewhat against you that you allowed that woman Jezebel to teach. And didn't say nothing about it. We understand, we see what happens. Over in the third chapter, it said in verse 1, it says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was what? Precious. precious. You know what that means? Scarce. Gold is precious. It means it's scarce. It was precious. It was scarce. In those days, there was no open vision. In fact, the Word of God tells us in Amos, in the 8th chapter, in verse 11, he says, Behold, the days come that I'll send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread or thirsting of water, but a famine of hearing the Word of the Lord. And shall run to the east or to the west, hunting it, you run in here and there, to and fro, and shall not find it. We're living in a scarcity of the word of God today, my friends. Whether you know it. Yeah, I say unto you, I have sent my word. And my word is the road map out of this world. You have a choice to either follow my word or deny my word. But know that one day you shall stand before me and give an account for your life here on this time, on this earth. I stand before you this morning and I call you to fall back to my ways, to turn to me, to listen to me, to follow me, to establish our relationships once again. Hallelujah. Give the Lord the glory in the house of the Lord. Verse 2, it says, And it came to pass at that time, when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 29 and 18 where there's no vision, the people perish. My friend, when we lose our vision for God or what God would have for our lives, we begin to perish. Perish means to die, separate from God that his eyes was dim that he could not see. Verse 3, And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Moses had given a commandment to keep the oil in the lamp that it would always be light in the house of God. Here, because of sin, because people moving the landmarks and people getting wrapped up in the world and doing the things of the world rather than the things of God, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, the, uh, the lamp of God is going out because the oil, the anointing is not in the church, uh, it's not in our lives like it should be. Uh, amen. And the fire of God is going out. Uh, that's what saves souls. Uh, fire changes the state of man. Uh, the fire of the Holy Ghost will change us. Conviction is no more. People are not convicted anymore.
because the fire has gone out. We know the story here, what happens. Eli had two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, and they out before the Philistines, out there fighting, and they said, hey, if we could bring the ark of God out here, then he would defend us. So they carried the ark of God out there, thinking that, hey, we got it, almost like Samson, you know, when he had laid with Delilah in the valley, stay out of the valleys of Sorica. And he began to, began to tell her all of his heart, pick up her ways, uh, and she cut his hair and he lost his strength and he's lost his vision because they put his eyes out. Uh, he thought that he would just get up uh, in the last time when he told her all, her heart, all his heart and said, I'll just shake myself as before. That's what these young men they had full of sin and they said, I remember how God used to move and we'll just get up and shake ourselves again. Get the ark of God and carry it out there. Only what happened, uh, the Philistines took the ark of God uh, and they killed Hopni and Phinehas, uh, Eli's two sons. Uh, and the word came back to Eli and he was a big guy. And uh, they told him that his two sons just died and he fell over and broke his neck and he died. And Phineas's wife was with a child, great with a child. And when she heard the news, she went into labor and she gave birth to a child and she named it Ichabod, which means the glory of the Lord hath departed. Uh, I hope that this building here, this church, uh, us, uh, never gets Ichabod stepped over it. I want the glory of God in our house. In this place. In this place. I need the glory of God. Hallelujah. You say, well, Brother Whitfield, one of these days somebody else is going to take over it and, and it'll all change. But let me tell you, on my watch, on my watch, I want to keep the Word of God and the glory of God and the fire of God burning in the house. I want to keep oil in the lamp on my watch. Are you with me? Are you with me this morning? You see... So often we think that God needs us. It's the same way as we think that the church needs us sometimes. People say, well, the church can't make it without me. Don't fool yourself. You want to see how it works, put you a glass of water, put your finger down in it and pull it out and see how big a hole you leave. Let me tell you, I, I don't need this church. This, you know, I mean, I, a church don't need me. I need the church. God don't need me. I need God. Amen. Amen. Brother Buddy, this church don't need you. You need the church. Hallelujah. There's protection in the church. Amen. What did Jesus say? Upon this rock, I'll build my what? He didn't say, Buddy, Todd. He said, the church. I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. We're a body. Are you with me? It's a different message, different time. But we need God. God is completed himself. The Philistines carried him, the ark of God, which represents God, carried it down to, uh, what did he carry him to first? Help me. Well, it's three towns. I know it's not Gath, and I know it's not Ekron, What's the first that starts with A? Ash, Ashton. Ashton. In, Ashlon, yeah. And he carried it down there, okay? Into the house of Dagon, fish god. And they put the ark down in front of old Dagon. Now there. God just sat there. They went home. And during the night, Dagon had a fit. They come in. And Dagon was face down in front of the ark of God. Ark just sitting there, face down. They get their block and tackle up, and they prop him up, and they get him up back on the stump. A lot of people serve a God, they got to prop up. I think, I think my God props me up <laughs> and holds me up and keeps me up. Amen. Brought me out of the miry clay, set my feet upon a solid rock, he established my going, and put a new song in my mouth. 
Are you with me? Yes. Oh, there's give out. They went home. Next morning, they come in, and Dagon done had another fit. The ark just sitting right there. And Dagon done fell over again, only this time his head's over yonder, his arms over yonder, hands over there. It's all scattered all over the place. Uh, the guys come walking in funny. <laughs> they all come walking in with hemorrhoids. God will be a pain in your behind if you don't listen to him. Are you with me? They all got hemorrhoids. What did they do? They loaded him up, uh, made some gold hemorrhoids and put in the, on the cart and send him over to Gath. And he got over to Gath and next morning them guys started coming into the house of their God and they was walking funny too and they said, hey, we got to do something, boy. Send him on to Ekron. And they sent him on to Ekron, you know, and when they got to Ekron, the people met him out there and said, don't bring him here. <laughs> We've already heard. Let me tell you, God is big enough to take care of yourself. Amen? You see, God don't need me. I need him. Look at the one next to you. Say, God don't need me. I need him. Oh, God, you're awesome. He's so awesome. The Philistines. The Philistines, long story short, took about 20 years. But he made his way back to Jerusalem. David brought him in, Remember? And they'd, they'd left it there at one fellow's house and heard that that house had been blessed. So David went to get him and get the ark and bring him back to Jerusalem. And they got it. And one guy leaned up there. wasn't supposed to touch the ark. Touched it to steady it. When it was about to fall off, he thought. And he dropped dead because he wasn't supposed to. The priest only went touches it. And David, it scared him. So he carried it to Obed, Odom's house. Left it there for three months. And his house was blessed. So David went to get it. And had the cart, had the ark on the cart, and the Bible said that David went six steps, six paces. He said, "This is all I can stand. I got to dance before the Lord." And he offered a sacrifice and praised the Lord. David was a praiser. That's how the presence of the Lord came back in to Jerusalem. Did you know that? You want the presence of God back in your life? You need to be a praiser. Look at what next to you say. You need to be a praiser. <laughs> God's good, isn't he? He's awesome. Listen to this. Philistine. You know what it is? It's a person guided by materialism. Mm -mm. That'll remove the presence of God from your life. When we begin to get guided by materialism, the, way, the world's ways, the ways of the world, it'll pull us from God. Pull God away from us. It'll pull us away from God. Amen? It is one uninformed and special area of knowledge. That's what a Philistine is. One that's uninformed and a special area of knowledge. In other words, they're easily deceived. That's why Jesus said in John 8, 32, shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Jesus said in John 17th chapter when he's praying, he said, sanctify them through thy word, through thy truth, thy word is truth. Right there, you want to know the truth? Right there, it's in the word right there. Don't listen to my opinion, anyone else's opinion right there. Go by that book right there. Amen, are you with me? I give you scripture for everything I say. I give you scripture for it. Understand. He said in Hosea in the fourth chapter, verse six, he says, my people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. How many agree in here that I try to encourage you to study your word? I give you tons of scripture. And if you don't get none anywhere else, I don't know how you survive, but you get a lot right here. And I don't have as many this morning, but you get it. But I encourage you to study, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. So we understand. He says, my people are destroyed. Why? For lack of knowledge. Because I have rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou should, shalt be no priest to me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I'll also forget thy children, who are sad. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Sound like America? 
I remember when America was our forefathers, you know. We believe that all men are created equal. Amen. Are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Amen. That was right in the Constitution of the United States. They couldn't, they couldn't come together on nothing. They were just all messed up, just time wearing themselves out. And they put everything down and they went across the street to the church. And they got on their knees and they prayed. Amen. Our forefathers of this country prayed to God of heaven. Amen. And they came back over and they pinned down the Constitution of the United States of America. The longest living document known to man other than the Bible. Amen. We need God, don't we? The more America increase, the less we dependent on God. You know, it's a whole lot easier to pray when you got money in your pocket. Isn't it? The Lord, I, I pray for my finances. Pretty easy there to do, isn't it? But buddy, when that old pocket's empty and you got to use faith. Are you with me? You see, when that America, God blessed America and, and we just get all these blessings and... and and you know, we're poorer now than we was when we started. When we started, we had no debt. We're about $36 trillion in debt now. We were shape financially than we've ever been. And we can't spend enough. Money is the answer. No, God is the answer. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. Then I will heal their land. Are you with me? Chronicles seven fourteen. Lord, you're so wonderful to us. Hi, look at the one next to you and say, how is the oil in your vessel? How's your oil level? Look at him telling you. How's your oil level? Ask somebody. I know I'm pretty to look at, but just kind of take your eyes off for a minute and look and then next to you. I can say that because I ain't close to you. Get up close and ain't near as pretty. <laughs> he looks good from afar. <laughs> your automobile out there has got Something in there every once in a while, y'all have to check the oil level in it. What's it called? Dipstick. Check your oil level. Amen? Maybe the Lord wants us to check our oil level this morning. <clears throat> How's our oil level? <clears throat> it's kind of like this. See, your house has no electricity in it, no power. You get on the phone, you call up your provider, whoever who it is. Here, it's Berkeley Electric. Say, I need y'all to come out. I ain't got no power in my building here. And they come out and they check all the way to the meter. It says, we got power right out here on your meter. The problem is not out here. The problem is in your house. You got a problem in your house. The reason you have no power. The problem is not God. This morning. Peter said. You know you, I've heard people say. Well I'm just destined to go to hell. That's, that's a lie of the pits of hell. First of all John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That Whosoever believeth in him, denoting a position, should not perish but have everlasting life. Peter says that God was not willing that any should perish. Not God's will that anybody go to hell. So next time you hear somebody say that, say that's a lie. That's a lie. Mm. 
the problem is in your house, sir. And we go to God and say, God, something is missing in my house. It's a problem with you. And he says, no, the problem is in your house. Your oil is low. Matthew, the 25th chapter, there's a story of the ten virgins. Five wise and five foolish. The five wise had oil in their lamps. The five foolish had no oil in their lamps. And they're waiting for the bridegroom to come. Morning, midnight, whenever. And they all slept slumbered and the call went out the bridegroom cometh and they all rose and the wise trimmed their lamps and the foolish tried to trim their lamps but there was no oil and they said give us of your oil give us of your oil save us some of yours give us some of yours and they said no least we have not enough going by and so they left to go buy oil and when they came back the bridegroom had come and gone. And I don't know what's in your lamp today. How much of the oil of God is in you today? How much God is part of your life? Do you give him just a little space or do you just give him all of you? So Lord, just take my life and just you know what I wanted to tell him the day I got saved, Brother Josh? I, I want to say, Lord, take my life. I have made a mess of it. Why don't you take the steering wheel now? And he did. And Ryan, he began to drive my life in the right direction. He began to order my steps and my life began to change for the good. And I've seen so many in the same way those coming to instruments this morning. You say, Brother Whitfield, my oil is low. I don't know much at all about God. How can He know about me? Believe you me, He knows all about us. You know that woman at the well in John the fourth chapter? Jesus went there before she ever came to the well and sat there and wait on her. She came through town. I, I believe I could see her coming through town with her head held low. The world had abused her and messed her life up so. She had five husbands and the man she was with was not her husband. I, I can just see people and she can hear the voices. Ah, there goes that old woman there. She's nothing. She's nothing. Oh, look at her life. It's a mess. And she gets to the well and there's the Savior of the world sitting there waiting on her. She's special. She's got a soul. And says... She had this bucket. It was empty. It represented her life. And long story short, after conversing with Jesus Christ, she left her bucket. Represents her life. And she went home with the well. I believe she went back through town like this with a glow about her. And she said, Come meet a man that told me all I ever did. Made a difference in my life has changed me. Wow. Isn't it amazing? How he makes a change in our life. He said, Brother Whitfield, my, my oil is like that woman's bucket. It's empty. He said in Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse number six, he said, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. I put on a sign, in fact, that uh, the sign's messed up right now, communicating to it. So I can't change it, so it's still up there. And it says, want to be hungry for God? Quit snacking on sin. Quit trying to fill the void in your life with the world's ways. It'll never 
satisfy. He said that, but they, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? Say it. You want to be filled today? Get hungry for the righteousness of God. God, I need you. Lord, I need you more than anything else. I do. I need God in my life more than anything else. God is my answer to everything and he's yours. Amen. Philistine takes away the presence of God and causes people to squander bottomlessly rich in cultural inheritance for a short term and meaningless financial advantages. It's all for nothing. All for nothing. Second Kings, read this when you get home. The fourth chapter, read the story. This woman was in need and all she had was a little pot of oil. She cried out and the Lord heard her. A man of God, Elisha. He says, what you got? She said, all I got is a little pot of oil. Then use what you got. Everybody in here has got something. You got legs to get up on. Use what you got this morning and get to the Lord. Go out and borrow vessels, empty vessels. And he said, borrow not a few. And they brought it in and he closed the door. And to begin to pour out of that one little pot, bring me another one. And they began to fill the vessels. And they kept filling the vessels to all the vessels. And she said, bring me another vessel. He said, to mama, that's all, that's all we got. There ain't no more empty ones. And the Bible said the oil stayed. Stopped flowing. Flowing. But it never ran out. God is more than enough to fill every one of our lives in here this morning. And I don't know where your oil level of God is. But God wants to fill you before you leave here today. But the choice is up to you. Amen. They're going to sing that song. Fill it up. Fill my cup, Lord. I asked her to sing this song. And if that's you this morning, as you stand, I want you to just come on to the altar. Just go ahead and stand and begin to come.